to get into the specifics of today. Um, many of you have already found the, the chat on the side of um, the YouTube uh, channel. If you have any questions throughout the talk for Tom, uh, you're welcome to put questions there. And I'll be the one who's sort of monitoring them. So if you notice me sort of back and forth, doesn't really seem like I'm paying attention. I promise I am. Um, I'll also have my phone up. If you want to send me direct email, um, you'd rather a question not be on the public forum, you're welcome to send me an email. And I'll be sort of um, monitoring those emails um, and those that chat group throughout the day, uh, sorry, throughout the, the presentation. And Tom will be stopping periodically. Uh, so we'll have a chance to um, ask him a few questions throughout the time. Um, so with that, uh, with that note, I would like to uh, take a minute to now introduce Tom. Um, so Tom and I, Tom Forney and I go um, basically back to the beginning of our reenacting career. We both started um, around the same time in the early 2000s um, in different groups. Uh, Tom rose quickly through the ranks of the uh, 41st Regiment, um, which of course will feature today. We'll get back into that in a second. Um, and I was in a separate group, but um, we quickly became friends. Tom's got um, a fairly infectious personality. It's hard to deny him if he wants to be your friend. Um, so uh, we, we quickly became friends and we've started working um, on a number of different projects together. My wife has gotten to the point that she knows that um, Anytime Tom calls, it's going to be with another project for the two of us to work on together. Um, but our first, I think our first major project that we worked together on was um, the 2012, sorry about that, uh, the 2012 History Symposium. I don't know how to mute my phone from here. So the first project we worked on together um, was the 2012 I don't even know where the phone is. Sorry, guys. Um, the 2012 History Symposium, um, uh, the bicentennial of the um, of the War of 1812, and we started working together on a symposium then. And ever since, I think we've we've put together basically every symposium since then between the two of us. So um, we've really started to work closely together, and we're really thrilled to present this. Um, turning back to um, Tom's reenacting career. As I said, he, he worked his way through the ranks in the 41st um, and eventually he became, he commanded that reenactment group. And today he commands the, um, the infantry version, the infantry battalion for basically all of North America. Um, and the reason not to suggest that I had anything to do with choosing Tom uh, but certainly the reason he was chosen for that position was um, just his, his passion for history um, and his knowledge and his, and his love for the hobby. And I think you're going to see all that as, as, we, um, as Tom goes through his talk today. Um, incredible knowledge on the 41st and their role in the Western District of the War of 1812. So I'm really thrilled um, that Tom agreed to do this today. I'm really happy to welcome him and I'm going to turn it over to him. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I've gotten into the groove of, of hosting conferences and, and haven't had the opportunity to present for a while. And, and uh, you know, we thought we'd want to test the technology and, and see what people's uh, receptiveness is to, to an online format, be, be, you know, because that looked like the way we were gonna go with the 2021 uh, spring conference. So, uh, had this information, at, you know, it's stuff I, I've worked on for ages and, and then had some fun earlier this, this fall on, on Twitter and was kind of doing a daily post. So a day by day following uh, the British retreat up the Thames, you know, finishing with the Battle of the Thames and, and, and thought that was that was ready made to be put into slides and, and, and shared in a format like this. So I'm kind of donating my time and, and donating my research, um, you know, towards this cause. And, and uh, there's another little video on, on the channel if you get the time to 
go check that out and, on, and it gives you some perspective what we're trying to do with uh, the future of the history symposium and, and heritage days. So let's dig into this. Uh, I love the title very much like you see in, in uh, the early 19th century where they got these massive long titles and, but it's not just something I made up, you know, inspiring this title was a, a directive from the Governor General, General of British North America, who is also the, the military commander in chief for North America. And that was uh, Governor General Sir George Prevost, who issued this general order on, on November 24th, 1813. With heartfelt pride and satisfaction, the commander of the forces had lavished on the right division of this army that tribute of praise, which was so justly due to its former gallantry and steady discipline. It is with poignant grief and mortification that he now beholds its well-earned laurels tarnished and its conduct calls loudly for reproach and censure. The commander of the forces appeals to the genuine feelings of the British soldier from whom he neither conceals the extent of the loss the army has suffered, nor the far more to be lamented injury it has sustained in its wounded honor, confident that but one sentiment will animate every breast and that zealous to wash out the stain, which by a most extraordinary and unaccountable infatuation has fallen on a formerly deserving portion of the army, all will vie to emulate the glorious achievements recently performed by a small but highly spirited and well-disciplined division led by officers possessed of enterprise, intelligence, and gallantry, nobly evincing what British soldiers can perform when susceptible of no fear but that of failing in the discharge of their duty. So, you know, this was a, a rather remarkable public and harsh rebuke of one of Prevost's commanders, uh, one of his divisions and a regiment that, that, that had played a key role in the defense of Upper Canada. So we'll spend time, you know, looking at the events and affairs that, that prompted this rebuke pictured here, and I'll caution that this isn't an actual portrait, it's more of a composite painting based on descriptions, is Major General Henry Proctor. He's seen in the uniform of a commanding officer of the 41st Regiment. And his court-martial provides us with an incredible range of first-hand accounts of the retreat and the subsequent battle, which I'll draw upon. Other primary sources, um, was a small book by Samuel Brown, an American historian who was actually a soldier serving with the US forces on that campaign. Um, and he wrote that in 1814, while the memories were still fresh in his mind. Another interesting resource is the company memorandum book uh, maintained by Robert McAfee, who was an officer in, in Richard Mentor Johnson's regiment of mounted riflemen from Kentucky. We also uh, look at the Moravian Diaries, a book called Wilderness Christians. And then another firsthand account, Richardson's War of 1812. John Richardson was a gentleman volunteer in the 41st Regiment and, and was part of all these events. A uh, little bit of perspective, a gentleman volunteer is a gentleman wishing to join the officer ranks of a regiment, but there's no room for him. So they serve in the ranks, hoping to earn distinction and promotion, but they mess with the officers so that they're, they're very much uh, socialized with them. So we're gonna focus on the autumn of 1813 in the area of Upper Canada, uh, I kind of encircled it there on this map, uh, known as the Wright Division. The British had divided Upper Canada into three divisions with the area, including Detroit, consider, considered the right division. So picture yourself standing on the map and looking south to the United States, and, and that would put the right division on at your right hand. So at this time, the entire population of Upper Canada was around 80,000 people. Uh, most of that population was in the Niagara area also in York, which is present day Toronto, and the St. Lawrence River Valley, including Kingston, which was the largest town in Upper Canada. The western end of the province, the area of the study, was sparsely populated with most settlements along the lake or major rivers, as a few roads were in very poor repair and seldom passable. 
you know, what got us here, a series of actions had given the British control over this portion of Upper Canada and Michigan. So it started with the capture of Fort Michilimackinac in July of 1813. So that, that's um, the upper part of Lake Huron at the entrance into Lake Michigan. Also the capture of Detroit, Michigan in August of 1812. The Battle of the River Raisin, also known as Frenchtown in Michigan on January 22nd, 1813. And then the siege of Fort Meigs, um, which run from April to May in 1813. And, and hi to my friends at Fort Meigs. I saw their comment in the chat. Um, through many of these actions, militia from Kentucky were often the, 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 the opponent and casualties, including two controversial issues with, with the British, British Indigenous allies, that being the slaughter of American prisoners at the River Raisin, and again at Fort Meigs. Remember the Raisin was to become an emotion-charged battle cry of the Kentuckians. Both the River Raisin and Fort Meigs were preemptive strikes designed to stop or slow American armies bent on recapturing Detroit. However, the tide began to turn with the British loss at Fort Stevenson in Ohio in August of 1813. The Wright Division had three garrisons in, all along the Detroit River in Amherstburg, Sandwich, uh, both of those in Upper Canada, and Detroit in Michigan. The total strength of these garrisons was approximately 1,200 men, with the majority being the 41st Regiment. The 41st had been losing men throughout 1813 in this theater, accumulating losses at, at the, the battles at the River Raisin, at Fort Meigs, and Fort Stevenson. They had received some transfers from their 2nd Battalion, which had arrived in Upper Canada earlier that summer. There was a naval depot at Amherstburg where the Lake Erie fleet was based. There was also a considerable number of indigenous peoples that were displaced from their homes and relying on, on the British Indian Department for support and sustenance. The army was very short on stores and the soldiers were six months or more in arrears of pay. Control of Lake Erie and access to shipping was vital to the supply and continuation of this division. So we're going to primarily focus on the period of time from the Battle of Lake Erie on September 10th uh, through to October 5th, which was the Battle of the Thames, and a few days afterwards, some of the, the lingering after effects of the battle. Um, if it was a, a boxing match, the tail of the tape, here are the, the two commanding generals. So William Henry Harrison, commander of the American Army, was born in Virginia in 1773. He had success as a military officer, particularly fighting indigenous peoples in the US Northwest with success as a participant at the Battle of Fallen Timbers and then as commander of the US Army at the Battle of Tippecanoe. He was promoted to Major General in 1812 and had command of the American forces at Fort Meigs. Politically, he was governor of the Indiana Territory from 1801 to 1812. In 1840, he ran for president of the United States with John Tyler as his running mate. The campaign slogan was Tippecanoe and Tyler II. Harrison won the election, but died shortly after his inauguration on April 4th, 1841. Henry Proctor was born in Ireland in 1763 with his father being a surgeon in the British Army. Proctor joined the 43rd Regiment as an ensign at the age of 18. In 1802, he was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, taking command of the 41st Regiment, which was serving in Canada. He remained in Canada up until the War of 1812. He was promoted to Brigadier General early in 1813, and several months later, he was promoted to Major General in command of the Wright Division in Upper Canada. So let's kick this off uh, looking at We'll do a day-by-day -day account. Friday, September the 10th, 1813, it had become apparent the Americans were gathering together a new army for the recapture of Detroit and a possible push into Upper Canada. The American Navy had just launched two new brigs, the Lawrence and the Niagara. With the British fleet in Amherstburg awaiting the completion of the HMS Detroit, the Americans had control of the lake. The naval base at Amherstburg was short of seamen, stores, and ordnance. To complete the Detroit, guns had to be taken from the fortifications in Amherstburg, and soldiers from the, the Royal Newfoundland Regiment and, and the 41st Regiment were pressed into service as landsmen on board the fleet. 
Feeling the desperate need of the garrisons, Commodore Robert Barclay sailed out with his fleet to meet Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry and the American fleet. The Americans were to win a dramatic victory. Perry wrote to General Harrison, Dear General, we have met the enemy and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner and one sloop. Yours with great respect and esteem. And Perry also wrote to Commodore Isaac Chauncey, commander of the U.S. Naval Forces on the Great Lakes. Uh, you can see a copy of that, that letter in the image. Sir, it has pleased the Almighty to give to the arms of the United States a signal victory over their enemies on this lake. The British squadron, consisting of two ships, two brigs, one schooner, and one sloop, have this moment surrendered to the force under my command after a sharp conflict. I have the honor to be, sir, very respectfully, your obedient service, servant, Oliver Hazard Perry. The British garrison at Amherstburg on September 11th was still not certain of the outcome of the, the naval action, but with no message or sign of the fleet, the worst was feared. Lieutenant Colonel William Evans, commanding officer of the 41st Regiment, had, tra had traveled from Sandwich with Major General Henry Proctor to determine the result of the naval action. By the 12th, it was assumed the naval action had been lost and the garrisons of the Wright Division could no longer be maintained. Arrangements began to be made for the movement of women, children, and anything that might be an encumbrance to the retreat of the army. The acting brigade major, Captain Hall, was sent with Matthew Elliott of the British Indian Department to meet with Tecumseh to arrange a council with the indigenous leaders. The 15th was set as the date. So with the benefit of records and history, we can look at the impact of the loss of the British fleet at the Battle of Lake Erie. Uh, Chris referenced many of the projects that, that we seem to get involved with. Here's one of them. Uh, actually, if you ever get the chance, search for the War of 1812 casualty database where we've tried to log every single casualty from, uh, from the Canadian militia regiments, the British regiments, and also the, the Royal Navy and Royal Artillery. So uh, looking specifically at the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, that they lost 16 men killed, 25 were wounded, and they had a, a total of 65 men taken into captivity for the 41st, seven were killed, 141 went into captivity. So over 200 men were lost to the garrison. That, that, that's a significant loss for a place that was already hard pressed for enough men to, to cover all their responsibilities. September 13th, 1813, um, in the absence of portraits, and we don't have many portraits of the key individuals, uh, I'll tap some friends. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Augustus Warburton, inspecting field officer of militia, effectively had command of Amherstburg. It was his understanding that Proctor had a meeting in Sandwich with Captain M.C. Dixon of the Royal Engineers, Lieutenant Felix Troughton of the Royal Artillery. Warbur Warburton was not invited nor consulted. Dixon was the only engineer with the right division he was shown a map by Proctor and Proctor indicated he would retreat to the River Thames and make a stand at Dolson's, a small trading post just before modern day Chatham. Dixon was to begin dismantling the fort at Amherstburg without alarming the indigenous allies. Troughton was to make arrangements for sending away ordnance and stores. He was to leave the field guns for the retreat with the army, but everything else was intended for the forks of the Thames in modern day Chatham, where he was going to have works erected. The dismantling of the fort began in a dramatic fashion as part of a facing was thrown in the ditch. Tecumseh flew off in a rage to Matthew Elliott. Elliott came to Warburton and con expressed concern about doing this without meeting with Tecumseh and his people in a council. He said they might cut the wampum belt and no man would be able to answer for the consequences. Warburton wrote to Proctor expressing his concern. Proctor replied, he had the perfect right to give any secret orders he thought proper to department heads. Captain William Caldwell of the British Indian Department said that after the loss of the fleet, the Indigenous allies were very apprehensive. He said some chiefs came to him and said they were very reluctant to move their families to Canada. They're also concerned about another deception by the British, referencing 1783, 
uh, which was the Treaty of Paris. In 1795, the Battle of Fallen Timbers and the resulting lockout of the fleeing Indigenous warriors at the British held Fort Miamis. Caldwell was so concerned about their mood, he moved his family away to safety. So September 15th was the first council. Tecumseh voiced his frustration over the dismantling of the fort and the lack of communications or explanations to him. A follow-up meeting was set for September 18th. If I can point out uh, that that large stone you, you see in the picture, apparently that, that was the speaking rock. So at council, Tecumseh would stand on that stone so he could better project his voice. So uh, his speech at this council or meeting, what was so remarkable, it was actually entered into the court martial transcripts. So, Father, listen, our fleet has gone out. We know they have fought. We have heard the great guns, but know nothing of what has happened to our father with one arm. That, that would be Commodore Barclay. Our ships have gone one way, and we are much astonished to see our father tying up everything, preparing to run the other way without letting his red children know what his intentions are. You always told us to remain here and take care of our lands. It made our hearts glad to hear that was your wish. Our great father, the king, is the head and you represent him. You always told us that you would never draw your foot off British ground. But now, father, we see you are drawing back and we are sorry to see our father doing so without seeing the enemy. We must compare our father's conduct to a fat animal that carries its tail upon its back, but when affrighted, it drops it between its legs and runs off. Listen, father, the Americans have not yet defeated us by land. Neither are we sure that they have done so by water. We therefore wish to remain here and fight our enemy should they make their appearance. If they defeat us, we will then retreat with our father. At the Battle of the Rapids last year, the Americans certainly defeated us. And when we retreated to our father's fort at that place, the gates were shut against us. We were afraid that it would now be the case, but instead of that, we now see our British father preparing to march out of his garrison. Father, you have got the arms and ammunition which our great father sent for his red children. If you have an idea of going away, give them to us and you may go and welcome for us. Our lives are in the hands of the great spirit. We are determined to defend our lands. And if it is his will, we wish to leave our bones upon them. Uh, as I said earlier, no portrait of, of Proctor exists, but he has been described as overweight. So that this uh, comparison to a fat am animal is rather insulting and telling. And uh, the battle at the Rapids in the last war was uh, the Battle of Fallen Timbers in, in 1794, which was previously mentioned. So September 16th, 1813, um, carts and wagons were being organized in Amherstburg for transport. Sufficient conveyances were to be arranged for families that wished to retire with the army. A Sergeant White of the 41st left Sandwich in charge of a boat of General Proctor's baggage. Captain Crother of the 41st Regiment was told by Proctor that the troops were to retire and it was his intention that ovens and barracks would be built along the route of retreat. 18 to 20 pirogues, uh, you can see an illustration of one there, uh, a shallow drafted watercraft built like a canoe, were to be made to transport the stores up the Thames. Crawford was to inspect a position at the Chatham Forks, which was described as a defendable military position. Ovens were to be constructed at Dolson's and at Sherman's and barracks or huts built at wards near the start of the wilderness. Crawther arrived at Dolson's and found that neither men nor tools had arrived. He went on to Chatham to inspect the forks of the Thames. September 18th, it's a second council with the Indigenous allies. Proctor arrived in Amherstburg and is cornered by Matthew Elliott. And he said Proctor should prepare for consequences of the most serious nature if he continued in his plans to retreat without consulting Tecumseh. He said the great wampum belt was to be brought to the council and cut into two at the center with the Indigenous chiefs keeping their half as a symbol of eternal separation. Proctor asked Warburton if he had shared Proctor's promises to Tecumseh. Warburton said, 
something along the lines of not knowing what promises were made and he had declined interfering. Proctor sent for Tecumseh for a private meeting. He showed him maps and the situation at Amherstburg, the Detroit side of the river and the surrounding country. He explained the enemy could pass gunboats or ships up the Detroit River, isolating the indigenous peoples on Gross Hill and the Detroit side, particularly if they also send a land force along the Michigan shore. They could also advance to the River Thames and totally cut off the right division. Tecumseh had many questions in reference to the map. Proctor assured him that he would not retreat beyond the River Thames and Chatham. Tecumseh seemed satisfied and wished to confer with the other chiefs. Proctor gave his speech at the council and it seemed well received. All right, so we'll pause. I can take a breath, a quick drink of water. And then uh, Chris, maybe uh, you can let me know if there's a few questions. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got one so far that I've seen. Um, so I'm going to uh, read it out from uh, Marcus. Um, so he's asking how effective uh, was the British Indigenous Council with relations? And he says, we hear of native assistance against the US Army, but were relations easy? So how effective were these councils in general? <laughs> I, I think they, they were effective in, in terms of, of, you know, the Indigenous feeling engaged and, and part of the decision making. Like generally, there was an entity, the British Indian Department, which was part of government. They had officers, but they, they were the liaison between the Indigenous peoples and, and the, the formal British Army. So the, the council was a way to, to go just beyond these liaisons in the in the British Indian Department and to be more engaged, uh, you know, with, with the command group. Thank you. I'm just double checking. Um, I don't see any other questions here now. So well, we'll, we'll dive back in. And I meant to, uh, as we started to caution everyone, I, I recorded a, a run through yesterday and, and this run about an hour and, and 20 minutes. Um, so you have the luxury of, of pausing, walking away, leaving, coming back to the channel the next day where the recording will be, but, but we're going to continue to grind through this. I, I did a, a lot of editing today, you know, trying not to take away too much of the content, but to streamline this a little bit more. So let's, Carry on, and we go to September 19th, where we see wagons and guns began to leave Amherstburg towards Sandwich. The Moravians, uh, so I should clarify that there was Moravians missionary and they had uh, a mission set up. They called it New Fairfield, but you will see it referred here as Moravian Town or the Moravian Village. So. Wagons and guns began to leave Amherstburg towards Sandwich. The Moravians record on this date that they're already seeing many refugees and their wagons passing through their settlement. Captain Crother had inspected the ground for barracks at wards and on his return contracted citizens to construct six clay ovens for the baking of bread at Sherman's. Uh, stores and guns, including two 24-pounders and two six-pounders, were loaded on boats at Amherstburg and, and began their journey to Sandwich. So checking back in, in with the Americans and, and, and looking at an American account, they were gathering their forces at the mouth of the Portage River, where they built a log fence two miles in length uh, to pen in the peninsula between the Portage River and Sandusky Bay. So you, you can see it in the circle there. So I, I think it's absolutely remarkable that, that they basically turn that entire peninsula into their horse corral. You know, many soldiers were arriving on horseback and it was felt best that they be on foot to board ships and travel to Amherstburg. Colonel Richard Johnson remained at Fort Meigs, but he had orders to advance with his mounted regiment to Detroit on the American side of the Detroit River. September 21st, Colonel Thomas Talbot of the 1st Middlesex Regiment received a letter from Brigade Major Captain Hall saying that 
Proctor intended to retreat to the Thames to make a stand with the assistance of the Indigenous allies. He was asked where he thought the best place might be. Talbot believed the intent was to make a stand at the forks of the Thames, but worried that the Americans might be able to land on Lake Erie and use a road that came to the rear of Chatham and cut off Proctor. He recommended the Moravian village as a better location. So it's a, a modern day picture of uh, the forks of the Thames in, in downtown Chatham. Um, we've heard mentioned several times Brigade Major Hall, and, and uh, I thought I'd touch on this for a moment. So that's Captain jo John Hall of the Canadian Regiment. He was also an inspector and superintendent of cavalry. So he was acting as Brigade Major on the retreat. So just... I don't know if this has any bearing on anything, but but I find it interesting where, you know, you know, the brigade major is a key part of the general staff and and communicates a lot of his orders and directions and, and instructions. And I thought it very odd that, that Proctor is most closely associated with the 41st Regiment and that an officer from the 41st wasn't used as brigade major, but rather someone that was really a, a complete stranger to most of the officers associated with the British Army on their retreat. So who knows if that contributes to some of the, the chaos that we're going to see on the next few slides. So back with the Americans, September 21st to the 25th, uh, 500 troops were being left at Portage to guard the horses. Some estimates suggested there were up to 5,000 horses left behind. Due to a limited number of boats, only a third of the army can be embarked at a time. The first wave was trans transported to put in Bay Island, and then the boats returned for the next wave. By the 22nd, the entire army and its baggage had been transported to put in Bay. Samuel Brown described seeing the captured and battered British fleet, and the troops were allowed to go on board to view the effects of the battle. Unfavorable winds kept the army at put in Bay on the 23rd and 24th. And finally, on the 25th, it was moved to Eastern Sister Island. Brown described the island as barely being three acres, and it was so crowded, men barely had a place to sit down. So back with the British, September 22nd, all stores were cleared of Amherstburg by this date, and the dockyard burned. There was a belief by the senior command that all stores had been moved to the forks of the, of the Thames by this point. Crother reported that no work party or tools had yet arrived at Dolson's as the boats, boats had been held up by contrary winds. And the last of the indigenous had crossed over from Gross Eel and the American shore by this date. So if you're looking at, at that map on the left of the Detroit River, kind of lower left, there's a massive island that that's Gross Eel. So there, that's where a large part of the indigenous encampment was. September 23rd. The public buildings were burned in Amherstburg and the garrison marched to Sandwich. Many men of the 41st Regiment were used to man boats and scows, used to drive cattle and used for other purposes. And those duties greatly diminished the numbers of the regiment. Bateau sent by the commissary to Long Point, uh, far up Lake Erie, somehow man managed to avoid the American ships and returned somewhere around this date with 131 barrels of flour. At this point, the troops were entirely without flour and had been issued potatoes instead of flour for three days. September 24th, Troughton of the Royal Artillery advised that four iron six-pounders were brought over from Detroit. He described the ordnance moved by water as being two 24-pounders, a large quantity of ammunition, four or five 12-pound carronades, one 18-pound carronade, along with one iron six-pounder and four iron six-pounders from Detroit, and one brass eight-inch howitzer with a large proportion of ammunition, shots, and shells, all the powder, ball cartridges, and small stores except that required for immediate use. None of this ordnance was ever prepared for use uh, during the retreat or the battle. But still available to the British Army was the field train, which had two six-pound cannons, three three-pounders, and a five-and-a-half-inch howitzer, along with a forge cart. September 25th, Lieutenant Colonel Babby of the Militia of Upper Canada met with Proctor and asked him 
who Proctor asked him to take men to go to the Thames and to repair the roads and bridges in preparation for the retreat. Captain Crother received an order from Proctor to explore the road reported from Lake Erie to Chatham. When Crother asked John Dolson about this road, he was told it was laid out but never started. If he wanted to find it, he would need a guide. Meanwhile, the army remained in Sandwich with the garrison continuing in Detroit. September 26, Ensign Benjamin Holmes of the Provincial Cavalry or, or Provincial Dragoons was stationed by Proctor near Amherstburg to watch for the approach of the enemy. He saw a schooner come into the bay. Some of its boats came to shore. Others were sounding the bay. Assistant Commissary General John Gilmore was ordered by Proctor to, to send provisions up to the Dolsons area. It was Gilmore's understanding that this is where the nearest ovens were built. Captain Crother of the 41st Regiment in the company of a guide went in search of the road to Lake Erie. As they began following it, it ended abruptly in the bush. The guide would not go on and said Crother can find his way as well as himself. Crother carried on in the direction suggested by the guide and used his compass. He came to the Lake Erie shore a little after sundown and spent the night. There was no road. Meanwhile, the army remained in Sandwich with the garrison continuing in Detroit. September 27th, Ensign Holmes reports that in the morning, the whole American fleet was standing in towards Amherstburg. His estimate was about 80 boats of various descriptions. Major Adam Muir of the 41st Regiment, who had command of the garrison in Detroit, received orders to destroy the public buildings and Muir and his garrison crossed over to Upper Canada. He said they were not accompanied by their in Indigenous allies. During the court martial, Muir insisted he had no orders and instructions regarding the retreat. About 5 p.m. that day, the 41st Regiment marched about 10 or 11 miles from Sandwich through the evening. Captain Dixon of the Royal Engineers said prior to the retreat, all the entrenching tools had been loaded on different boats. He said they could have been put into carts as they were quite few in numbers. Uh, remember that there's going to be a lot of mentions of the entrenching tools. A report comes into Proctor that five men from the 41st had deserted. The 41st are now at a farm called Laval's. Proctor was spending the night in another home some three or four miles to the rear of them. He sent word they were not to march until he gave the command. Also on the 27th of September, the American army landed expecting resistance as it deployed for its advance on Amherstburg. Instead, they were met by a deputation of ladies who Governor Shelby of Kentucky, who was traveling with the U.S. Army, gave his protection. The U.S. troops marched through town to Yankee Doodle. They found an 18-pound gun abandoned at the battery on Bois Blanc Island. Matthew Elliott's orchard was stripped by, of peaches by the American soldiers. Ensign Holmes, who had been sent instructions to destroy the bridge at the River Oak, Oak Canard. He insisted it was done. However, the Americans sent an officer and 20 men forward to preserve the bridge. They see the enemy trying to burn it, but they fire on them and disperse them, saving the bridge. September 28th, Proctor sends word that he wants Muir to search for the five deserters. He also sends further direction for the troops to wait at Laval's as it is raining and he wants to wait on the indigenous peoples as their retreat was far slower. Meanwhile, at Laval's, Major Muir joined up, you know, with Major Muir and the, the, the Detroit garrison joined up with the rest of the 41st Regiment and the entire body began to move off towards the River Roscombe. The troops were well underway when Lieutenant Colonel Warburton received Proctor's follow-up order to remain at Laval's. Warburton sent a reply they were already on their way and would carry on to the River Roscombe. Lieutenant Colonel Evans of the 41st Regiment was very ill and upon arrival immediately went into a home and slept the rest of the day. Provisions had been shadowing the march of the troops in boats. Two oxen were killed at the River Roscombe for the use of the troops and reports were received that the clay ovens at Sherman's and the slaughterhouse and bakehouse at Dolson's were completed. Tecumseh was still back in Sandwich. He'd stayed with Lieutenant Colonel Babby at Babby's house. Ensign Holmes of the Provincial Dragoo Dragoons was sent with a detachment to Turkey Creek to destroy the bridge. So Turkey Creek is between Sandwich and Amherstburg. 
he reported that he was successful. September 29th, Babby sent a scout to determine the location of the enemy. A report came back. They were at Turkey Creek repairing the bridge. The troops marched from the River Roskin for Trudell's, which was about 15 miles and just above the mouth of the Thames. They were to remain there until September 1st. Warburton claimed that Proctor passed them on the route of march. He left a message at Trudell's for the troops to stop there. There was no further word or instruction. Sergeant White of the 41st, uh, with his wagons, had passed through Moravian Town and the wilderness in two days and a night. He said a great deal of baggage remained, which belonged to different officers in the dragoons. The march of the troops was impeded several times by baggage on the road. Carts and wagons were heavily laden with the private property of residents of Amherstburg and Sandwich. Billy Caldwell of the Indian Department said the last of the, the indigenous people left Detroit on this day. So on the same day, back with the Americans, uh, their column arrived at Sandwich. The mounted column on the American shore had reached Detroit. They reported that the fort and stores buildings were burning, but ineffectively, they were saved and preserved. September 30th, the British hold at Trudell's for the day. Lieutenant Colonel Evans of the 41st says he was not advised of nor understood the reason for stopping for a full day. Lieutenant Colonel Warburton is now ill. He had sent a letter advising that he wished to move the troops the next day to Dolson's as provisions were not being sent back as promised. Along the route of the march, Babby overtakes a number of Indigenous people, some of whom are preparing to camp at the River Roscombe. He told Matthew Elliott and Tecumseh that they should hurry them along to the Thames as they might be overrun by the enemy. Proctor had desired that a set of bridges close to the mouth of the Thames be destroyed to slow the enemy. Elliott of the Indian Department vehemently objected, saying this would cut off a number of the Indigenous families. Proctor was also concerned about the return of the HMS Nancy from Mackinac on the upper Great Lakes, as it would not know of the change of affairs along the Detroit River. It was at risk of being captured. He proposed that a Captain Francis Antoine Larocque of the Canadian Chasseurs to provision a birch bark canoe to take a letter to the master of the Nancy. Larocque claimed he could not do this due to difficulties getting provisions. <laughs> I don't I think he wanted to go hundreds of kilometers in a birch bark canoe. Around midnight, a dragoon arrived with a letter for Proctor saying Warburton was going to march the troop to Dolson's the next, next morning at daylight. Proctor sent a reply saying they were to wait until they received further orders. October 1st, further word is received that the enemy has also been seen on the march in the area of the River Roscombe. Word sent for Proctor, but it seems he'd gone on to the Moravian village. A number of officers conferred and decided that the ground was not advantageous for meeting the enemy and that they should move to Dolson's. Throughout the day, the troops arrived at Dolson's with the last coming in with Warburton around 4 p.m. Proctor arrived back in Dolson's around this time. Wagons had been sent forward with the baggage. Included in this was a spare musket ammunition, some 20,000 rounds. Estimates had the soldiers with about 50 rounds each. Brigade Major Hall was sent to you know, check out the enemy vessels on the lake and to destroy the bridge over the lower forks if possible. He felt it was too great a risk to destroy the farthest bridge, but with the help of two men and a boy, local inhabitants, they destroyed the nearest one. Hall was also to post Ensign Holmes and a party of dragoons at Trudell's to patrol constantly along the bank of the river. There was no rear guard or picket between Trudell's and Dolson's. Also on this day, the Moravian diaries record that 76 sick soldiers were quartered in Moravian town. Moving on to October 2nd, the army is stopped at Dolson's for the day. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Evans of the 41st claimed that he was not advised of nor understood the reason for stopping for a full day. Evans also noted his dismay at finding many women of the regiment at Dolson's. He had difficulty moving them and thought it might be due to their husbands not being paid in, in six months or more. Dixon was sent by Proctor to examine the position at the Forks in Chatham. Upon his return, he reported to Proctor he did not favor the area. Proctor was anxious that something should be done at the Forks or Dolson's. Dixon's preferred Dolson's, although he did not highly recommend it. 
A clerk received orders to proceed without delay with a bateau of flour to the ovens built at Cornwall's or Sherman's farms between Chatham and Moravian Town. The clerk did not do so. He delayed with the boats with the excuse that he had to provide for his family. Proctor decided to hold at Dolson's and appointed Captain Crother of the 41st Regiment as assistant engineer and directed Dixon to show Crother points to be occupied so that Dixon could accompany Proctor to the Moravian village the next morning. The plan was to throw up some earthworks to create batteries and to fortify the log buildings on the riverbank and cut loopholes in them. A deputation of indigenous warriors associated with the Americans came into camp under a flag of truce. They were saying the Americans would attack the next day before noon. And this one's striking from John Richardson. I, I said he was a gentleman volunteer with the 41st Regiment. He reported that there was a rumor that the officers were meeting to debate as to whether or not the command should be taken from the general, that being Proctor. So not all was happy in the British camp. October 2nd, from the American perspective, with the British halted at Dolson's for the day, the American army actually reached the River Roscombe. They find the bridge was not destroyed. October 3rd, at Dolson's, Crother had directions to throw up a battery for two field places, two field pieces. Crother went up to Bowles, uh, just beyond the forks in Chatham, where the entrenching tools were, but there was no way to convey them back. He returned to Dolson's and found Captain Chambers and asked for a wagon or boat and was told that Chambers would not give him one. He went to Warburton and told him he needed to get a wagon. Warburton wanted to know why. Crother told him that Dixon and Proctor had given him instructions to throw up a battery and fortify the buildings. Warburton said it was too late. The Americans were advancing and the men were getting under arms. Lieutenant Colonel Evans seems to be uh, incapacitated by fever. Warburton is in command at Dolson's, but it seems that Warburton had no knowledge of plans to fortify Dolson's, nor did Proctor leave any instructions for him. Ensign Holmes and his party of dragoons are captured. A sergeant and eight men of the 41st were also captured in a boat. Warburton prepares to make a stand at Dolson's. He sent Matt Matthew Elliott to tell Tecumseh that they trusted the indigenous allies would hold the opposite riverbank. Elliot returns and tells Warburton that Tecumseh is determined to fall back to the forks of the Thames where fortifications were promised. So the same day at the forks, the army retreated there. Elliot came and told Warburton that the indigenous were very upset at the lack of the promised fortifications. He said, I will not by God sacrifice myself. Earlier, Warburton had sent a dragoon with a letter for Proctor explaining the threat to the army at Dolson's along with a request for instructions. The dragoon returned saying that Proctor read the letter and carried on to the Moravian village with no reply or instruction. Warburton felt it was a mistake and asked Captain Coleman of the provincial dragoons to go himself to Proctor and state the position of the army along with the reaction of the indigenous allies. Proctor had reached the Moravian village that evening and walked the ground with Dixon. It was felt the whole area was extremely favorable for defense. The whole village could be used to advantage. Proctor said he would move the troops there immediately, but as the nights were very dark, he'd wait until the morning to return to the troops. Coleman reached Moravian town at 12.30 a.m. He understood Proctor was staying in the priest's house. He went there and was told Proctor was in bed. Coleman asked, Coleman was asked if it could not wait until the morning. He replied that it was Warburton's desire he should return as soon as possible with an answer. Proctor came out and replied, retire from Dolson's. I never intended they should. Coleman explained the provisions and stores had been sent on to Bowles. Proctor replied, then they must be sent back again. Riding through the night, Coleman returns to Warburton. So on the same day, October 3rd, the Americans were cautiously advancing on the shore opposite to Dolson's. So as I understand it, the, the, you know, the major road at, at the time up until Dolson's was on, uh, I'll call it the south side of the Thames. And then there was a crossing either by boat or, or ferry at Dolson's where the primary road carried on north of the Thames from there. 
So the Americans were, so they, they spent the night at Drake's farm. It was about eight miles above the mouth of the Thames. So, so very close to Dolson's. They were also able to get their gunboats over the sandbar at the mouth of the Thames, but it was felt they, they would not be able to get them much farther than Dolson's. So another quick break, uh, take my breath, and then we'll move on to the, to the battle next. But Chris, maybe you can let me know if there's any questions. Sure, yeah, we had one from Nicholas Ryan um, a few minutes ago. Um, and an interesting question, did the British forces make any efforts to regulate the organization or equipment of their native allies the way they might with the militia? Or did they leave that entirely to the native leaders themselves? I do not think they had any influence in that direction. That's more my impression or opinion, but, but no, I do not believe so. Thank you. Um, and I will uh, just give you another second to catch your breath. I don't see any other questions, but um, sometimes uh, it takes people a second to get them typed out. So maybe we'll just give them a few seconds. All right. And I'm just checking email as well. Um, a quick reminder, if, if you don't want to post on YouTube, um, you're welcome to just send me an email if you'd rather a question that way. That works as well. But I don't see anything else. So well, let's, um, I think let's turn to the battle. Let's carry on. We got one more day of marching and, and then the battle. So October 4th, uh, you know, continuing the, the retreat going from the, the forks in, in Chatham to Bowles, which is a farm just beyond Chatham. After riding through the night, Coleman returns just before daylight to say Proctor would be joining the troops that day. Dixon and Proctor leave Moravian Town at daybreak. Dixon is riding on horseback. Proctor is riding in a gig. Brigade Major Hall is monitoring the Americans with some dragoons. He paused to examine the abandoned stores at Dolson's and found 25 cases of ball cartridge. He loaded that in a pirogue and sent it to the forks. Ovens had been abandoned at Dolson's. They were still full of bread. The Americans made an appearance and began skirmishing with indigenous warriors in the area. Hall rode back to Warburton to update him. Elliot at the forks came from Tecumseh to say they were now determined to retire on the Moravian village. Warburton waited with the 41st Regiment at the forks expecting Proctor. Americans were now in the area of the forks skirmishing with the indigenous warriors. Warburton called in the pickets and began to retreat. As they were on the march, they received word from Proctor to retire to him at Bowles. Rations were issued, the meat was raw and not yet divided, and then the order came to march. Billy Caldwell, the Indian Department, said they had lost around 600 Indigenous allies when the retreat from Dolson's had started. These folks had considerable baggage and children and chose not to follow the, the army and the retreat. So at Bowles the same day, Crother was, was summoned by Proctor who told him he wanted to block the navigation of the Thames to prevent the American gunboats from coming up. The Mary and the Eleanor were to be laid in the best position and then scuttled. Crother was also to destroy the naval and ordnance stores at Bowles. Ammunition was destroyed at Chatham that morning with guns and shot thrown in the river. At Bowles, destroyed were several pieces of ordnance, an immense quantity of shells and shrapnel, and fixed ammunition of every description. Also, a great quantity of cordage, cables, sails, and a great number of naval stores, the remains of what was from the depot at Amherstburg. Two vessels were burned, which were full of stores and fixed ammunition. Going from Bowles to Sherman, the troops continued to march through Bowles towards Sherman's, which was about nine miles uh, short of Moravian Town. Proctor continued on to the Moravian village. Captain Dixon of the Royal Engineers received an order from Proctor to send for the entrenching tools for setting up the works at Moravian Town. No one knew where the entrenching tools were. Lieutenant Colonel Evans said the men had been issued meat, but had no time to cook it. He thought some men were issued bread, but many did not receive any. Upon arrival at Sherman's, Evans says he was disappointed that no ovens had been constructed. 
Sergeant Grant of the 41st Regiment was in the last boat to leave Bowles. It was quite late at night when it seemed the boats could go no further. Fearing the Americans were close, he left the boats and advanced by road. He found Lieutenant Colonel Warburton and Lieutenant Colonel Evans in a room together in the farmhouse and said the boats and provisions were still downriver and measures needed to be made to preserve them. The answer was, very well. Grant stayed at Sherman's for the night. Captain Bullock, with his grenadier company, stayed with Muir in the rear guard at Richardson's, uh, a farm just before Sher Sherman's, in the event of an American attack. There are claims this was the first day that there was a formal rear guard. At Moravian Town, the missionaries record that it is wild in the town. Their homes were filled with soldiers and refugees as they hurriedly packed their own things. The indigenous brethren, hearing the Americans were advancing, had fled upriver with their cattle. With the Americans on October 4th, they had experienced skirmishing that day. The bridge over, the, over McGregor Creek in Chatham had been taken up, but the Americans repaired it under fire. They found a house on fire with a, a considerable number of muskets inside. The fire was put out and the muskets saved. Uh, you can see a, a sketch of... Uh, the Battle of the Forks, as, as the Americans called it, or the skirmish at the Forks uh, by McAfee in that, that company memorandum book. The Americans advanced about four miles upriver from Chatham, finding burning boats filled with ordnance and stores. They captured two 24-pounders with carriages, ball, and shell. So here's a strange story. Uh, it comes from Chatham. Uh, a ship was discovered during the summer of 1900 and later taken to Tecumseh Park at the Forks where, where this photo was created. City engineer Edwin Jones examined the vessel and found fire damage and boreholes in the bottom of the ship, indicating that it had been burned and scuttled. Those involved with the salvage reported finding several cannonballs, rusted bayonets, grape shot and other military items. A historical association had been formed in Chatham that would see to the preservation of what they believed was the, the General Myers, but they could not raise the necessary funds. The General Myers was then sold to the Manson Campbell Fanning Mill factory, who cut her up and made gunboat furniture out of her. They also made keys to the city and other trinkets. <laughs> what, what an incredible loss. It, it would be so amazing if that had been preserved to be able to go see that. Now we come to October 5th, the day of the battle, but first the, the troops had a march to finish off. They awoke, there was no bread. Cattle had been brought down from Moravian town, but as the soldiers had no utensils, it was sent back to the village to be prepared. The grenadiers and rear guard marched to Sherman's looking for rations. The guns were sent forward early so they would not slow the column on the bad roads. There was confusion around the location and status of the boats. Brigade Major Hall rode to Warburton with instructions from Proctor to send a sizable party to assist getting the boats upriver. Warburton replied the boats were taken long ago. Chambers of the 41st Regiment had tried to get the boats moving. He saw the captured boats and the approaching Americans on the opposite side of the river. He reported this to Proctor and gave an estimate of there being approximately 3,000 Americans as their column of march extended as far as he could see. Proctor did not believe him and said he wanted to see for himself. As Proctor passed the column, he told it to halt and write about face. The column was still about two miles short of Moravian town. Proctor then continued on to survey the enemy. Shortly after, the general and his staff came galloping back up the road and ordered the men to form line. Proctor sent word for a six-pounder gun to be sent back. Lieutenant Gardner of the 41st Regiment, with gunners chosen from the 41st, took the gun back while Troughton of the Royal Artillery went on to Moravian Town to sight the remainders of the guns for the defense. The Moravian Diaries record General Proctor, having spent the night in Moravian Town, saw his wife depart for Delaware by water that morning before joining the Army. The military hospital and patients were also moved to Delaware. So Sergeant Philip Brooks of the 41st uh, was captured with the boats and he had also made a return. So 14 men of the 10th Royal Veterans, 10 sailors and carpenters from Amherstburg, 
four or five men from the Royal Newfoundland Regiment and approximately 63 men from the 41st Regiment were captured that morning. So with the Americans that day, they rose early and renewed their pursuit. They reported capturing two gunboats, several bateaux and a considerable amount of provisions and ammunition. Shortly after, they reached the ford uh, at Arnold's Mill. Those mounted crossed the river at the ford. The rest of the army was transferred across the river in the captured boats. It's a long process due to the limited number of boats, but the army is completely across by noon. They soon passed the site of the British camp from the night before, which would have been Sherman's. So final preparations for battle, Lieutenant Colonel Evans estimated there were maybe 280 rank and file of the 41st Regiment to form the line. Proctor wanted to form the line in an open area, but Matthew Elliott argued he would not be able to count on the assistance of the indigenous warriors. The major reason being it was too far from Moravian town, they would not be able to de deposit their families return in time. As a result, the troops were formed in a wood when the troops formed line, they were clubbed, meaning companies were in the wrong position. There are also indications that rear rank stood before the front rank. Tecumseh made some objection to the disposition of the troops. And as a result, the light company and grenadiers were pulled from pulled away and positioned. Um, accounts vary, estimates were 100 to 200 yards to the rear of the, fr of the first line. The provincial light dragoons were formed some 50 yards behind the second line. Proctor was positioned just ahead of the, the dragoons. After a period, a small group of dragoons were sent forward to help guard the lone gun on the road with the first line. So for soldiers that, that, that have trained a lifetime to fight in, in carefully orchestrated formations, this was highly unusual. These two lines separated by 100 to 200 yards nowhere near enough men to, to cover the breadth of the battlefield. So there were wide spaces between all the ranks. Uh, not having eaten for two days, uh, they were extremely disconcerted. And then they caught word the boats were captured and there was no spare ammunition. Proctor being aware of the shortage of ammunition, he wondered about options. He thought about some of the, the, the remaining ordnance, could that be used to make up additional ammunition? And was told, told only the spherical case shot would be suitable, but there was no paper for making cartridges. <clears throat> Samuel Wood, chief of stores and ordnance was sent to General Vincent in the center division with a request for ammunition. Nice thought, but Vincent was at minimum 125 miles away. The indigenous warriors were positioned to the right of the first British line, their position bordering on a swampy area. Matthew Elliott thought there were perhaps 500, 500 indigenous. Ensign Cochran of the 41st Reg Regiment was skeptical of this number and felt there were no more than 250. As a majority were still in Moravian town, where defensive works were promised and the majority of the artillery were being sighted. Troughton of the Royal Artillery had positioned the guns in the village and on the ravine. With the troops positioned and prepared to make their stand, they awaited the approach of the Americans. Estimates on the wait vary from two to three hours with the troops standing in position. No screen of skirmishers was pushed forward. No effort was made to prepare defensive positions with brush and trees to obstruct the mounted infantry that had been pursuing them. So now we come to the battle. From Lieutenant Colonel Evans of the 41st, it was unclear if anyone had command of the first line. <coughs> he said that both he and Warburton were stationed between the two lines. Various testimonies are confusing and contradictory. It seems the first line stood in the wooded area. They heard a horn sound before them. After a short while, a second horn sounded, but it was closer. With the sound of a third horn, firing commenced. The Americans focused on the British line and ignoring the indigenous position. It seems the firing began on the right of the line, which was soon breached by cavalry. There are varying accounts of how many shots the first line fired. Some felt the right of the line fired two shots and the left fired one shot. Some claimed an effort was made to have an orderly retreat, but most indicate that once the American cavalry were in the rear of the first line, men ran for the second line or threw down their arms and surrendered. 
Officers, including Lieutenant Colonel Evans, were shouting at the men, trying to get them to form and resist, but it was futile. Evans, riding for the second line, had his horse overturned, was wounded, and captured. Most accounts claim the lone, lone gun on the road with the first line never fired. It seems the horses with the limber panicked and got tangled with the dragoons, and all of us was charging towards the second line. For Major Muir at the second line, the dragoons, horses from the guns, survivors from the first line, passed through the second line with mounted Americans in close pursuit. The second line fired once, but was soon breached by the enemy and forced to surrender. Some men escaped into the woods, including Captain Bullock and, and some of his grenadiers. Through the brief action, Proctor was heard shouting, for shame, men, for shame, 41st. Why do you not stand and fire? Those mounted fled the battlefield back to Moravian Town, covered by a small screen of provincial dragoons commanded by Coleman. At a small broken bridge, Colonel Babby was thrown from his horse. His horse turned across the road, dismounted several dragoons and other riders, and this chaos allowed Proctor to escape. From the American perspective, uh, you know, going back to Samuel Brown, and, and you'll see a sketch uh, from McAfee's uh, mem company memorandum book, uh, Brown describes the charge was beat. In an instant, 1,000 horses were in motion at full speed. They broke through the British line on the right and formed in their rear. The enemy pieces were now unloaded. Their bayonets were not fixed. They surrendered. The whole was the work of a minute. The shock was unexpected. Some were trampled under the feet of our horses. Others were cut down by the soldiers. Very few were shot by our by our men for our fire was not general. Never was terror more strongly depicted on the countenances of men. Even the officers were seen with uplifted hands exclaiming quarters. There's not a lot of a detail on, on the battle with the indigenous warriors on the right and the Americans. William Caldwell said the warriors gave way slowly and by degrees as the Americans advanced. Caldwell had left the battlefield as that battle still waged. Lieutenant James Fraser of the Indian Department was with the Indigenous warriors as the battle started. He said the warriors retreated to the swamp and then the Moravian village where continued American pursuit forced them into the woods. John Richardson, the, the gentleman volunteer with the 41st Regiment, was captured during the battle. And he offers this secondhand account. Tecumseh was personally opposed to Colonel Johnson commanding the American mounted riflemen. And Tecumseh, having seriously wounded Johnson with a ball from his rifle, was in the act of springing upon him with his tomahawk when Johnson drew a pistol from his belt and shot him dead on the spot. Turning to an American account by McAfee, uh, the battle on the left wing by the 2nd Battalion was against General Tecumseh and his Indians and was much more obstinate. Logs, brush, and swamp prevented them from charging through, and Indians fired so hot that the companies had to dismount and fight from behind trees in the Indian way. Repeated charges and repulses took place from each side. Colonel Johnson was wounded at the first fire. General T Tecumseh is said to have fell by the hands of our colonel. Lieutenant Felix Troughton of the Royal Artillery was in Moravian, the Moravian village as a battle rage. After a time, he saw Proctor, his staff, and some dragoons and other mounted people arriving. Proctor directed Troughton to move the guns to the other side of the ravine. He drew his guns up into a line of four guns with the fifth, a three-pounder in advance upon the point of the ravine. The brigade major returned and shouted from horseback at some distance, do the best you can, and then he rode away. The artillery remained in position for 15 or 20 minutes. Firing seemed to be moving towards them in the woods to their right. They decided to spike the guns and Troughton mounted his crews on the horses and they rode away. Ensign Cochran of the 41st Regiment quipped, Proctor never rode faster in his life for he well knew Kentucky and horsemen in pursuit had sworn to scalp him. Some of the captured 41st officers after the battle were accompanied by Harrison's staff and they, and they went to visit the spot where Tecumseh's remains lay. They recognized him from their many interactions with Tecumseh. It has been said that some of the Americans had flayed Tecumseh's body and made razor strops of his skin. Many of the indigenous bodies were badly mutilated. 
something frontier war fighters did as retaliation for the mutilation of their own dead at the hands of the indigenous peoples. Turning to more debate and controversy, who killed Tecumseh? Popular lore suggests Colonel Richard Mentor Johnson. He took this claim to the position of vice president in the 1836 election where he was the Democratic nominee for vice president running with Martin Van Buren. Johnson campaigned with the slogan, Rumpsy Dumpsy, Rumpsy Dumpsy, Colonel Johnson killed Tecumseh. The Democrats felt Johnson was a liability in office. They refused to nominate him in 1840. Van Buren ran without a running mate and ironically lost the election to William Henry Harrison, Johnson's commanding officer at the Battle of the Thames. Another candidate for, for being the person that, that, that killed Tecumseh was William Whitley. William Whitley was a popular choice as he was old at the age of 64. He had been a famed Indian fighter on the frontier, rising to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in the Kentucky militia. He had retired, but in 1813, he returned to the Kentucky militia as a private, was one of the mounted riflemen. He led the forlorn hope on the indigenous position. Whitley was wounded during the forlorn hope and died shortly after. There were many claims that was Whitley who had shot Tecumseh, but Whitley was no longer alive to give his an account. Uh, the power of the internet and social media, we actually have some ancestors of Isaac Hamblin on, on this conference with us today, and uh, they, they share an account that was published in the newspaper of his experience at the Battle of the Thames. And I find his account remarkably similar to that of John Richardson. So some excerpts, he says he was standing but a few feet from Colonel Johnson when he fell and in full view and saw the whole of that part of the battle. He was well acquainted with Tecumseh having seen him before the war. He thinks Tecumseh thought Johnson was Harrison as he often heard the chief swear that he would have Harrison's scalp and seemed to have a special hatred towards him. Johnson's horse fell under him and he himself being also deeply wounded. In the fall, he had lost his sword and his large pistols were empty and he was entangled with his horse on the ground. Tecumseh had fired his rifle at him and when he saw him fall, he threw down his gun and bounded forward like a tiger, sure of his prey. Johnson had only a side pistol ready for use. He aimed at the chief over the head of his horse and shot him near the center of his forehead. So, the regimental books of the 41st were all destroyed or lost, but Evans had a return signed by the adjutant for, for the strength of the regiment on the, the 5th of October. He knows of no difference with the exception of five men missing for, from Muir's detachment and two casualties on the road by death. So uh, the count was 671 men, but there was also these disbursements. So the sick and convalescents totaled 127 men, uh, the artillery, another 28 men, lost in the boats, 143 men, and then men uh, farther up river with the baggage uh, was 59. So that left uh, 313 men on the field that day, or not 248 privates, which, which Evans had described as his estimate. In the first line, uh, four sergeants and 14 rank and file were killed and a sergeant and 24 rank and file were wounded. The next day at Fairfield or, or Moravian town uh, from the diaries, brother Schnell said that the town filled up with thousands of Americans, many of them mounted. At first the Americans were friendly and promised no harm, but soon they began accusing the Moravians of hiding British soldiers and goods and pressed them to reveal their location. Homes, the church, and school were ransacked. The Americans feasted on the village's food stores. General Harrison arrived in the village with some officers. Shaw went to him and asked for protection from the wild mob and for compensation for the goods taken from the Moravians. Harrison answered curtly, you can move out, but you will not be compensated. Schnall tried to say more, but was cut off by Harrison, who said he had no more time to listen. Um, Commodore Oliver Perry, he had been with the American army serving as an aide to Harrison. He heard all of this and met Schnall in the street afterwards. He was very friendly and said he'd help the Moravians obtain a pass so they could move out unmolested. 
Towards noon, Perry told them that he would soon go from the settlement and feared that if they were still there after he left, they might not get away at all. General Harrison, too, said in his curt manner, see to it that you get out of here. Hearing the town was to be burned to the ground, they made haste to leave. Then back to Proctor, he had rode that night with his party to Delaware, a distance of approximately 55 kilometers. October 7th, the Moravians record an extremely difficult journey to Dolson's. Rain had ruined the road and the largest bridge was destroyed by the retreating British. They claimed to hear nothing but wailing and weeping from inhabitants along the river. Retreating indigenous had taken their horses and slaughtered their cattle and pigs as well as stealing from their homes. Two of the best flour mills had been burnt as well as two sawmills. After the indigenous, the two armies took whatever was left. From McAfee's company book, the mounted regiment was camped in the town with the foot soldiers still camped back at the battlefield along with the captives. Very early that morning, Ensign Cochran of the 41st Regiment came in with six men and surround, surrendered. McAfee described him as a well-informed young man and much of a gentleman. McAfee had informed him of the British's cruel conduct to pris prisoners, which he claimed Cochran very much condemned. Orders were given by Harrison to make rafts and boats to carry the plunder down the river. Plunder gathered, the army prepared to march off, and the town was set on fire, starting with the Moravian church. The army marched to the large plantation where bake ovens were. They had five, 400 to 500 prisoners. So I find this, this interesting. I don't know if, if you recall, you know, when Evans expressed disappointment when they got to Sherman's, there were no bake ovens. But here from an American account, you know, as they were starting their return to the U.S., they get to Sherman's and they do see bake ovens. And I think the discrepancy might be back all the way to that clerk who had the bateau of flour, you know, to go to Sherman's, who ultimately didn't do that. So, so maybe there were ovens, but there wasn't the flour to make bread with. October 8th, the remnants of the British Wright Division are at Burford, some 150 kilometers from Moravian Town, working their way to the center division's headquarters at Burlington Heights, uh, which is modern day Hamilton. Sergeant Major Fitzgerald of the 41st saw six wagons under the charge of Sergeant White of the 41st. He asked him what, what he had and was told it was General Proctor's baggage. From the memoirs of Private Shadrack Byfield of the 41st, he said he had made his way to Burford that night and fell in with a party of men who had charge of the general's baggage. Lieutenant John LeBreton of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment received orders to take a flag of truce to go to the American Army to plead for just treatment for the prisoners and to ask for the return of private items captured. From McAfee with the Americans, they camp just before the mouth of the Thames River. McAfee observes that the inhabitants are very cautious, and though the Americans have taken what they wanted and almost ruined some men, yet they submit to it without a murmur. Shadrick Byfield observes that the men with the general's baggage were being too free with it. He pushed on with difficulty as his shoes were largely worn out. Before nightfall, he fell in with a larger party of 41st under the command of Captain Bullock. An interesting note, there was actually two Richard Bullocks who were officers in, in the 41st at this time, father and son. And after the war, both settled in Upper Canada after they concluded their military careers. Richard Bullock Jr. became the Adjutant General of the Upper Canada Militia. From McAfee, the Americans marched early on in disagreeable weather to the mouth of the river where the shipping lay. In their absence, the Navy had taken a British schooner that had been up on Lake Huron and was laden with furs. It was taken without a gun as it sailed up to the U.S. vessels without knowledge of the events of the past month. Jumping ahead a little to October 13th, Le Lieutenant LeBreton described how he come across a party of 41st soldiers about 20 miles from Sandwich. He asked them what they were doing and why they were there. They said they were prisoners and on their way to Sandwich in a boat, but were landed at the spot where they had been for some time. They complained about being without provisions. When asked about their escort, they said they did not have one. LeBreton tried to convince them to return with him as it seemed they were abandoned. They refused. And one said, I have been long enough a slave and, and am now determined to have my liberty. The Americans had captured about 600 prisoners. Uh, surprising to me, they also took into captivity the wives and children of the captured soldiers. 
uh, British officers who pledged parole were loaned pack horses to ride. The prisoners were first taken to Camp Bull in Chillicothe, Ohio, which was being built to house the prisoners captured at the Battle of Lake Erie. The 600 additional prisoners were too much for Camp Bull, so orders came to move the army prisoners to the Newport Barracks in Kentucky across the river from Cincinnati. Camp Bull would be used for the naval prisoners. The officers had stayed in Chillicothe on parole, but when a plot for escape was discovered, they were handcuffed and transferred to Frankfort, Kentucky. Held in the Frankfort jail, the officers shared accommodations with the like, likes of those in the attached image. Generally, while in captivity, the soldiers were treated well, but upon their negotiated release and their escorted march back, they endured a considerable amount of hardship, deprivation, and cruel treatment. There were many desertions amongst the prisoners and considerable illness amongst those who ultimately returned to Upper Canada. So just as we're wrapping up, I want to highlight a couple interesting artifacts associated with the battles. Uh, the Americans first captured this gun known as the Burgoyne, Burgoyne Canyon at the Battle of Saratoga during the American Revolution. The British got it back during the fall of Detroit in 1812. And at the Battle of the Thames, it was recaptured. The gun has remained in Frankfort, Kentucky since the end of that campaign. It's now on display at the Kentucky Historical Society. Also in their collection is a drama of the 41st Regiment. It was presented by General Harrison to the state of Kentucky. His notes of appreciation are painted on the black shield, which covered the 41st markings. From the personal effects of, of Major General Henry Proctor captured at Moravian Town uh, is a letter seal and a watch chain and fob. These are in the, the museum collection at Fort Meigs in Ohio, which is just an absolutely outstanding sight. Uh, we're gonna wrap up talking about the court martial of Henry Proctor, that, that started the 21st of December in Montreal, Lower Canada. Uh, the first charge, he did not immediately make the military arrangements best calculated to facilitate the retreat after the loss of the British fleet at the Battle of Lake Erie. The retreat was unnecessarily delayed until the evening September 27th when the enemy had already landed in considerable force within a short distance of Sandwich. Such conduct endangered the safety of the troops under his command by exposing them to be attacked by a force far superior to them. This being contrary to his duty as an officer, prejudicial to good order and military discipline, and contrary to the Articles of War. Proctor was found not guilty of this charge. The second charge, after commencing the retreat, he did not use due expedition or take the proper measures for conducting the retreat. The division was encumbered with large quantities of excess baggage. It was halted unnecessarily for several whole days and having omitted to destroy the bridges over which the enemy would be obliged to pass, such conduct betrayed great professional incapacity being contrary to his duty as an officer, prejudicial to good order and the military discipline and contrary to the Articles of War. Proctor was found guilty in that he did not take the proper means for the conduct of the retreat, but not guilty for the remainder of the charges. The third charge, he did not provide security to the boats, wagons, and carts laden with the ammunition stores and provisions required for the troops on the retreat, and allowed them to remain in the rear of the division on the 4th and 5th of October, so they either fell into enemy's hands or were destroyed to prevent capture. This resulted in the troops being without provisions for a full day prior to being attacked on the 5th of October. Such conduct on the part of Major General Proctor being contrary to his duty as an officer prejudicial to good order and military discipline and contrary to the Articles of War. Proctor was found guilty of not having afforded adequate security to the boats, but not guilty for the remainder of the charge. A fourth charge, having ensured the Indian chiefs in council at Amherstburg that on their arrival at Chatham, they should find the forks of the Thames fortified, did nonetheless neglect to fortify the same. He also neglected to occupy the heights above Mor the Moravian village, although he previously removed his ordinance with the exception of one six pounder to that position, where by throwing up works, he might have awaited the attack of the enemy and engaged them to great advantage. After receiving intelligence about the approach of the enemy on the morning of the 5th, he halted the, the division two miles short of the village and formed it in a situation highly unfavorable for receiving an attack. 
manifesting great professional incapacity on the part of Major General Proctor, being contrary to his duty as an officer, prejudicial to good order and military discipline and contrary to the articles of war. He was found guilty of not occupying the heights above the village, but not guilty on the remainder of the charge. Fifth and final charge, he did not make the military dispositions best adapted to meet or resist the attack on October 5th. During the action and after the troops had given way, he did not make any effectual attempts in his own person to rally or encourage them or to cooperate with and support the Indians who were engaged with the enemy on the right. Major General Proctor, having quitted the field soon after the action commenced, such conduct betraying great professional incapacity, leading to the defeat and dishonor of His Majesty's arms, to the sacrifice of the division committed to his charge, being in violation of his duty and unbecoming and disgraceful to his character as an officer, prejudicial to good order and military discipline, and contrary to the articles of war. It's quite the charge. He was found guilty in failing to adopt the military dispositions best calculated, but not but found not guilty of the remainder of the charge. So in conclusion, the court found that despite the extraordinary circumstances of the situation, Proctor had been erroneous in judgment and deficient in energy during the retreat. The recommendation was that he be publicly reprimanded and suspended from rank and pay for the period of six months. The Prince Regent, who had to approve uh, the charges associated with all court martials of, of this nature in reviewing the findings of the court, criticized them as lenient on the one hand, but reduced the punishment on the other. The charges, findings, and sentence was read at the head of every regiment of the British Army. So as we're wrapping up, uh, my thoughts, uh, I, I think we probably all saw and felt that there was a profound lack of urgency going on here. I don't think this was entirely on Proctor. Proctor like we've seen a real lack of leadership from the senior officers associated with his command. Uh, I, I think a big contributing fact, factor, and it didn't really come out in the court martial, that there was a considerable dysfunction in the officer's mess of the 41st Regiment, that there was two different cabals, uh, they didn't get along and um, actively disliked and undermined each other. Uh, I think the, one of the really telling things was the absence of an effective rear guard. You know, so you look at the, the Napoleonic Wars, something like, um, you know, the retreat of General Moore and his army, you know, to Corona, uh, it seemed like daily there, there was major actions where the rear guard was slowing the pursuit of the French. Or you, you hear the accounts of, of Marshal Ney of, of the French, you know, commanding the rear guard as Napoleon was trying to extricate his army from Russia and, and how much fighting there was and, and how effective that was here. We've seen absolutely no effort to slow down or obstruct the Americans, even though the Americans' own accounts indicate that they're cautiously advancing, expecting to, to run into some type of a rear guard. And then finally, um, this failure to use the Moravian town, uh, village, and gully. Uh, I'll explain more. Here's kind of a, a map or a recreation of what the Moravian mission looked like. Uh, you can go to the Fairfield Museum now, and, and there's a replica of that, that main street. You can walk that, uh, where they show the outlines to where, where the houses or huts were, and it ends at uh, where you see that, that creek depicted there. Uh, I was always curious as I drove through the area, I, you know, I read different accounts or seen different things where they talked about the heights above Moravian Town, and it's funny, you drive by on the highway and, and it's remarkably flat and, and featureless. I, I see no heights, but, you know, it's funny when you walk the ground, um, imagine huts like that with loopholes cut into it, um, you know, uh, a fighting withdrawal down the street. And with so many trees on it, it's hard to see. But once you get to the end of the property, that, that creek gully is very, very deep, you know? So imagine 
uh, guns on the opposite side, one small bridge that crosses the ravine, and then also the majority of, of the army and muskets there, it would be a substantial obstacle for the pursuit of the Americans. So it's just dumbfounding why they never did what his stated intention was, you know, to defend Moravian town. Maybe it was uh, that there was too many families and, and civilians in the village, their, their baggage. Um, it, it's hard to say, but it, it was a real piece of neglect. So closing, uh, Henry Proctor, he returned to England in 1815, remained semi-retired, never holding a senior post again. He died at Bath in England on the 31st of October, 1822 at the age of 59. Um, I'll readily admit, I do not like what I have seen of Proctor. And it's not just this retreat. There's much in his time with the 41st Regiment that shows undesirable aspects of his character. A number of his actions and decisions contributed to the disastrous defeat on the Thames. But on the other hand, I do try to be sympathetic. He was in an impossible position with very little support. Not only was he the military commander, he was also the civic leader for the, the captured city of Detroit and that portion of Michigan with very little staff to support him for much of that time. He'd asked for troops and support for a winter attack on the dockyards at, at Preskill, Pennsylvania, you know, down the coast in Lake Erie to destroy the new American ships that were being built. And this was denied. He was charged with the care and feeding of thousands of indigenous peoples in, in this area, but at the same time experienced chronic, chronic shortages of supplies and money. He was told by his commander to hold to the last extremity in the face of an American attack, and in the event of a retreat, to take the Voyager canoe route to Montreal, which would mean transporting his entire garrison up through Lake Huron to Georgian Bay, some 600 kilometers before they'd even encountered the, the canoe route, hardly helpful ad advice. So combine all of this with a fractious core of officers and you have the recipe for the confused sloppy mess that, that we've been discussing the, the last hour and a half or so. And that brings us to the, our conclusion. So Chris, if there's any more questions, I'll handle those and, and then we can wrap this up. Thank you, brilliant. Yeah, so um, a question, um, uh, it's sort of a two-part question. So I'll give you both parts and you can decide how to divide them up on your own. What eventually happened to the prisoners of war and were the Canadian, quote unquote, Canadian soldiers treated differently to the British soldiers who were captured? Um, second part, it de the Canadian prisoners, it depends which theater. The, I do not believe that there were a whole lot of them captured, uh, you know, along the, this Thames campaign. Uh, what happened to the British prisoners? Uh, it's funny, I, I, I've done a whole nother talk on that. So that's easily another hour and a half where, where we talk about, uh, you know, the prisoner cartels and, and how the camps were managed, how they were fed, how they negotiated exchanges and, and, and their release. So, but generally speaking, I think in these prisoner camps, um, they were treated quite well. You know, I expected a problem, but I guess given away the, you know, the the surprise or, or the answer with, with what happened to the 41st prisoners, when they were being marched back in um, summer of 1814, at the same time, the siege of Fort Erie was going on. And then the, the American commander really worried about a fresh influx of 600 soldiers, you know, coming back to Upper Canada to, to join the British forces. So he had them held in a swamp uh, in sight of, of Fort Stevenson. And while they were there with, with very few stores, while they were on the verges of the swamp, uh, then many of them got a, a form of malaria. And, and then when they were marched to the lake shore, yeah, they were out of food, they were eating green apples, they were, so there, there's terrifying descriptions of, of the state of, of the men as they were finally returned to Upper Canada, that they landed uh, in the area of Port Dover in modern day Ontario. So. 
Thank you. Um, a few more questions here. I'm just um, uh, reading through lots of very uh, positive comments. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Marcus is indicating that he's uh, looking forward to your next 90 minutes on uh, the prisoners of the 41st. Um, <laughs> A question on uh, the 41st, were they considered an elite regiment, would you say? Um, sort of uh, a comparison to the Marines in the U.S. I don't want to get into a, um, <laughs> I don't want to offend any of our, our U.S. friends uh, by suggesting what's an elite regiment in the U.S. or not. Uh, but were the 41st considered an elite regiment? No, uh, you, you know, the, the history of the 41st, that they were founded in, in 1719, but, but they come into being um, as a regiment of invalids so that they were out pensioners from uh, the Royal Hospital at Chelsea. Um, and they thought that these old soldiers maybe would still be useful so they could use them to defend ports and, and, and for different things around the UK and, and not have to use up healthy younger men. Uh, so uh, their regiment of invalids, they became the 41st regiment of invalids. And then somewhere in the late 1780s or so, th then they were promoted to a regiment of the line. So, you know, they spent some time in, in the Caribbean after that, more or less got wiped out by malaria. And then the, the, off the surviving officers and sergeants came back to the UK, to Ireland, to, to start rebuilding the regiment. So, so you know, technically they, they were a fairly young regiment, even though that their number, the 41st, suggested that, that, that they had a fair bit of seniority within the British Army hierarchy. And it's funny, you mentioned Ray at the outset, you know, how we're dedicating the, this talk to him. Ray and I had had chats about Prevost's condemnation of a regiment. Like, you, you know, was it easier because of the 41st humble origins? You know, they had had no battle honors uh, they had not much of a history or reputation so it's much easier to throw them under the the bus as, as opposed to say uh, oh i don't know the first royal scots that have been around since the the days of caesar you, you know so so no they, they didn't have a, a big reputation you know they, they did go on um to strong service you know they got four battle honors in Canada for the War of 1812, more than any other British regiment that, that served on the station. And then afterwards, um, you know, their service included, uh, you know, Burma, Afghanistan, they were in the Crimea, part of the Boer War. And the 41st went on to become uh, the, the Welsh Regiment. And uh, in the modern British Army, uh, they, they are part of uh, the Royal Welsh. Thank you. Um, another uh, uh, question here, um, an interesting point um, about the, the sort of setting for the battle, if you will. Uh, so the question is just how wild would, it, would this area of Upper Canada have been? What was the state of the roads, bridges, et cetera? How built up were the towns, villages, that sort of thing? Yeah, it's funny. It was uh, exchanging some some emails with, with our mutual friend and, and, and a great historian, Glenn Stott, you know, yesterday. And, and, you know, Glenn has studied a lot of Southwestern Ontario, the, the Valley of the Thames in those areas. And, and he said that from Chatham to Lake St. Clair, so, so closest to Detroit, um, you know, where Dolson's was, that, that, that area, the, there was no real communities, but, but it was, it was completely covered by, by farmsteads along there that they were side by side. But once you got beyond Chatham, so beyond Bulls, then it, it became very sparsely populated so that there was quite a distance between the, the, the different farms or plantations as the Americans called them. Thank you. Um, I'm just... Uh... Looking around, lots of comments, very positive comments. Um, I, uh, I think I told everybody at the, at the outset that uh, Tom had a wealth of knowledge, and I think, I think everybody saw that. 
Um, I'm just trying to check through and, and make sure I didn't miss any questions though. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I think the, the Proctor court martial is uh, the transcript is of something like 400 handwritten pages, you know, and it's organized um, as you'd expect a court to be testimony, you know, um, and then, and then a, a counter interrogation and uh, it, it was quite incredible. So it was, it was quite a long time going through it, but trying to, to sort all these different um, individuals accounts into a timeline, you know, so, so that, that we could have this today. So. Um, an interesting one from uh, again, from the UK uh, this time from Kate um, do we know what the rank and file felt about the reprimand? Uh, I assume that's um, um, the uh, not the rec sorry not the rec reprimand of uh, Proctor himself, but of the regiment. I haven't heard accounts of that, um, so I, I know we shouldn't take ourselves and and, and trans pose ourselves in that position, but, but you consider the rank and file, the, the level of education, and, and you look at, at Prevost's reprimand, the verbosity of it, like, I don't know that a lot of these guys would, would, would even understand it, or, or are, they, are they standing on parade while those things being read to them, and they got sore feet, you know, they just want to go with their mates for dinner or, or, or to go grab a drink. Uh, I, I don't know that, that they'd even pay much heed to it. So, but the officers would very much, very much feel that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. It would be an interesting one to debate. Yeah. There's so little from the rank and file, you, you know, because of the level of education, even when you hear about Shadrick Byfield's uh, memoirs, even those where uh, a friend had listened to his reminiscences and, and wrote it for him, you know. So. Yeah, we are really blessed by Shadrick Byfield, though. He's a fantastic source if people don't know him. Um, which, I, which I can add, if you go to the 41st website, then there is uh, a transcription of, of his memoirs in the history section there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to mention that. It's a uh, the, actually, the the forty first website in general is a is a fantastic resource on the War of eighteen twelve inf information. Yeah, and I'll, I'll likely take my notes from the, the daily blog and, and the stuff that that form this, and I'll tidy them up a little bit and probably post them in the history section on the forty first website too. Fantastic. Um, how experienced were the officers who would have presided over Proctor's court martial? Do you know much about them? Yeah, quite a bit. Um, <laughs> it was quite a remarkable cross section. So the the court martial was presided over by Francis de Rottenberg, who is uh, you know famous for creating the the light infantry doctrine for the British Army. Ironically he was Proctor's commander at the time of the Battle of the Thames. So he was Lieutenant General of, of upper, upper Canada and commanded all the, all the military elements. And, and I, I think he was a great theorist. I, I don't know that he was that great in, in the field, but it was, um, it was quite a number of generals and, and, and colonels. So, so people that, that were very experienced. And I find it interesting where, the charges were very well informed, you, you know, as this was brought against Proctor, but um, I guess the Brotherhood of Officers, I, I think they were awfully lenient to him in, in terms of absolving him of a lot of the charges or the worth that worst aspects of this. So. Yeah, it's interesting. You wonder how much effort they, they made to, to truly understand the situation and put themselves in in his shoes, as, as you were mentioning at the end of your talk, um, really understanding what he had to deal with. Yeah, it's, it's hard to wonder if it's just he was aloof, preoccupied with his own belongings and his family and, and, and 
and and not really connecting with with his men or, or you know was he overwhelmed with, with stress and fatigue you know and not capable of making good decisions i i think it was a mix of both you know and and an interesting aside i don't know how many people have been to Fort George and Niagara and the Lake? So it's a, a Parks Canada site, a, a recreated, a recreation of Fort George from the War of 1812. But if you go into the officers' mess there, uh, you'll see on the walls that they have uh, the mess rules of the 41st Regiment. And what I find interesting is the reason that is available for them to recreate and post on, on the walls of their mess was because it came from. Uh, the U.S. archives, a folder titled Captured Enemy Correspondence. And so that come out of Proctor's baggage and captured papers, but associated with that was actually a letter to the, to the officers of the mess of the 41st where Proctor was condemning them for not giving him the, the proper respect and courtesy due to his rank. So even though a mess was supposed to be rankless, he still felt as the commanding officer of the regiment that, that he was entitled to more respect than he was receiving in the mess. So it runs deep. Uh, another fascinating document on the 41st website, if you look, um, a court-martial transcript of Benoit Bender, who was a lieutenant in the 41st Regiment. And interestingly, uh, he was also the brother-in-law of Major Muir. Muir had married Bender's sister. So um, this is Chambers, uh, an officer of the 41st, bringing these charges forward, basically accusing Bender of cowardice. Um, so you get some really interesting accounts, particularly of uh, the River Raisin and the attack at Fort Stevenson um, at, from people's testimony, but it, it just goes to show the acrimony between Chambers and, and Muir. And this goes back to the, the siege at Fort Meigs, you know, uh, an American relief column attacked the British batteries, took over, uh, they were counterattacked by the British and both Chambers and Muir tried to take credit for being, you know, the key officer leading the counterattack and recapturing the battery. So it just uh, never ended, you know, with the, the 41st miss. It's, uh, it's not exclusive to the 41st mess, though. I think you see this, um, you know, there are a lot of dysfunctional messes in the time. It's really interesting. But um, just, uh, I'd like to address everybody before we I think I've, I've covered all the questions I sorry I'm sorry if I missed any um, but if there are any in the future um, feel free to send me an email I'm happy to pass them on to Tom um, and you never know what's going to spark the basis of our next lecture of uh, from a question like on prisoners of war um, in Ohio um, and also on that note we'd love to hear from you on feedback um, if you have any um, questions for us, like I say, but anything you want to pass on to us, we'd be happy to get. Um, if you even have suggestions for the future, we'd love to hear those as well. Um, so feel free to send me an email. Of course, you can keep commenting um, on the video on YouTube, but probably an email is, um, I'm more likely to see that and more likely to respond. So that's probably the easiest way. But um, before um, people um, start logging off, I just want to say once again, thank you very much to Tom, um, an incredible wealth of knowledge um, and an incredible passion, as I said earlier, for this hobby and um, really, truly blessed to have you uh, take some time out of your day. And you, I know the last several weeks as well as you were putting this together. So thank you very much on behalf of everybody on this call. We really appreciated you sharing with us today. Well, my pleasure. It's a shared passion that we all have, and, and it's nice to be able to, to share some of the, that knowledge and information. So also going to remind everyone, uh, you, know, you know, we'll reach out, but stay tuned. Uh, February 27th, we put together uh, the conference, the annual conference, and, and then maybe we can have another talk or two before then. So include that in your feedback. You know, do you welcome these periodic standalone lectures or talks? And then, um, and then did the technology work? I, I think it went well, uh, especially by the, the questions and, and reaction, because 
this is probably the format we're going to use for the, the February conference. All right. Thank All you. right. Well, I'm going to stop the streaming. So thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. So glad uh, you took your time out of your day to join us and to support our, our project. So really appreciate